Hello and welcome to the Cambridge University Press Literature and Performance Festival. My name is Emily Hockley and I'm the Commissioning Editor for Literature and Theatre at Cambridge University Press. And I'm really delighted to be interviewing Paul Edmondson and Stanley Wells for today's session on all the sonnets of Shakespeare. Paul Edmondson is Head of Research and Knowledge and Director of the Stratford-upon-Avon Poetry Festival for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Stanley Wells is Honorary President at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. They've both written many books on Shakespeare and also many books for Cambridge. Um, the Sonnets edition is their third collaboration for Cambridge, following on from Shakespeare Beyond Doubt and the Shakespeare Circle. But without further ado, Paul and Stanley, for the benefit of those audience members who haven't perhaps yet read the book, um, can you briefly outline what makes your edition particularly groundbreaking um, and really what, what led to the idea for the volume in the first place? Yes, well, what makes it groundbreaking is really two things. One is that we order Shakespeare's sonnets, not in the order in which they were first printed in the 1609 quarto, uh, Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted, it was called, but we try to put them into chronological order of composition, which means rearranging the, 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 from the original order. This is the first time anybody's attempted to do this. The second point of specific originality is that we intersperse the, the non-dramatic sonnets, the poems printed in 1609, with extracts in sonnet form from Shakespeare's plays. He used sonnet form uh, for uh, up to nearly 30 times in his plays, and we uh, thought it would be interesting to, to intersperse the, the non-dramatic sonnets with the dramatic sonnets. And the idea came sort of serendipitously when we were both teaching a class one morning at the Shakespeare Institute, the University of Birmingham for their Shakespeare and creativity students. And we were teaching the sonnets. And um, I heard myself saying, wouldn't it be interesting to put the sonnets in chronological order as far as we can and intersperse the sonnets from the plays among them? And that was the beginning. That's what set the ball rolling. Three, three years or so ago, wasn't it? Right, more than more than three years ago. But, but also to say that that, that that point was arrived at through the work we've done on the sonnets in yes, the past, yeah. you know, 15 or so years. Yeah, we have published a book with us about the sonnets with the other press, with the Oxford <laughs> Press. That should not be named. Reading the introduction, you, you give a really good sense of um, the, the 1590s being a particular time um, for, for sonnet writing and actually a kind of explosion of sonnet writing happening then. Um, what, what do you think particularly distinguished Shakespeare um, from his peers within that context and what, what set him apart during that, that particular um, uh, trend? I think it's basically that Shakespeare is not write, writing a sequence. The, the 1591 publication of Sir Philip Sidney's sequence was followed by another 18 or so sequences of sonnets within a few years before up to 1597. And they're all unified sequences, most of them addressed to a particular individual, usually with a, a, a romantic name like Fidessa or something like that. Uh, Shakespeare was, was not writing a sequence, which means that his sonnets are far more varied in style, in tone uh, and in purpose. Some of them, one or two of them are letters, uh, sonnets. Some of them very introspective uh, meditations uh, and they run, run a big gamut through, through, through uh, of emotional uh, 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 ambition. So, 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 I mean, one of the things that we solve at a stroke in a way, um, actually I shouldn't use the word solve, we're not solving anything, we're simply making ourselves available as accurately and as, we as best we can to these remarkable poems. But one of the things that does is it removes from the sense of them that there's, there was ever a sequence intended. Yeah. Um, so Shakespeare's not writing a story. He's not producing a sequence of poems in the way that his contemporaries are. And, and that, that's, that's unsettling. That completely uncouples any suggestion of fair youth or, or dark lady, which are stories we've been bringing to these poems only since the end of the 18th century. And yet it still goes on being reiterated. Uh, the idea that this is a sequence, I'm reviewing a, a new book now, 
which talks about the sonnets as as the first 124 addressed to a young man, the remainder addressed to a dark lady. It's it's nonsense. <laughs> They're not. They were never there in the first no. place. <laughs> but people um, gone. <laughs> I think um, I think often people tend to sort of think about sonnets um, as a form as being as being quite serious and earnest. Um, can you can you tell us a bit about how Shakespeare actually uses um, the sonnet writing form as um, as a comic instrument um, in in the plays? Yes, uh, thank you, Emily. So because we put the play the sonnets and the plays into the chronological order. It's interesting to note that the first few sonnets from plays are from comedies. The Two Gentlemen of Verona, um, The Comedy of Errors, and Love's Labour's Lost. And in all those instances, um, they, those plays suggest the use of the comic, the comic form of the sonnet. Um, years ago, um, as a postgraduate, I, I happened to play Valentine in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. And there's a hilarious scene it's really a truly funny scene when he has to conceal a rope ladder about his person and a letter, uh, which it turns out to be the, a sonnet letter. And he's discovered by the father of the, who's the Duke of Milan, of Sylvia, with whom Valentine's trying to elope. And it's like a time bomb waiting to go off on stage comically. And the Duke reads Valentine's sonnet letter aloud so we, the audience, can hear it. And it's a slightly clumsy sonnet. It's somebody who's been trying really hard to write a sonnet. Um, and so that's in that's in the book on page 50. My thoughts do harbour with my Sylvia Knightley. And uh, um, it, it, it starts. And the and then Love's Labour's Lost. Yes, it Love's Labour's Lost. Uh, Shakespeare uh, has the, the lovers speaking sonnets, which are deliberately parodic. Indeed, one, one or two of the sonnets in the 69 collection are comic, too. The one, for example, which sends up the whole notion of the son. My mistress, I is nothing like the son, he says. It's a parody of the Petrarchan conventions uh, of, of de comparing the beloved to the son. And, and Another thing. So Shakespeare is far more varied in in tone than most of the sonnets in the in in the in the fifteen ninety one to seven sequences. Mm, I think um, yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, following on from that, I think the the sonnet collection um, has has acquired a, a romantic reputation as well. Um, and uh, in in the edition, you kind of highlight how. Um, how their treatment of love is actually a lot more complex and a lot more multivalent and, and messy, really, um, yeah. than, than that romantic vision, um, which you know you can can pick up on on that idea from looking at many many covers of different editions of the sonnets with with red mm -hmm. roses um, all over them, etc. And um, what what relational encounters and feelings do do the sonnets explore, and and which do you personally think are the most affecting? Goodness, well, they, they cover such a, a, a range of emotions. Um, just to follow an image through that popped into my head when you were asking the question, Emily, they, the, the sh copies of Shakespeare's sonnets tend to break out into bookshops in Strapped Upon Avon around Valentine's Day. And every time I see this happen, I think, well, I wish you wouldn't. <laughs> because they're sort of the last volume that you would really want a beloved <laughs> to you in, if you were to read it from cover to cover. Obviously, there are some great romantic poems in there, and we wouldn't wish to deny that. So, for example, 116, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds, Admit Impediments, Sonnet 29, When in Disgrace with Fortune in Men's Eyes. Many of them are, you know, lyrical and um, uh, celebratory of love, but many of them aren't. So, and many of them are about jealousy and self-loathing and mortality and guilt. Um, and regret. And one of them is a religious poem too, for example. One for six. One for six. Uh, 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 yeah. So they're very much more varied collection than the pub than the public the popular imagination suggests. They're also, um, it seems to us, very many of them feel confessional. Yeah. Um, by which I would want to mean the speaker of the sonnet, whether that's a, a character in one of the plays, as in our volume. Or Shakespeare writing a sonnet for the, which appeared in the 1609 collection, seems to be opening up their uh, inner self, either in a moment of epiphany, uh, such as Beatrice in Much Do About Nothing, when she hears 
and is gulled into thinking how much um, Benedict really loves her. And she steps forward and speaks a sonnet, what fire is in mine ears. It's the first verse she speaks in the play. This is significant. Um, or whether it's um, Shakespeare really working through powerfully, for example, Sonnet 129, the effects of lust, the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in yeah, action. Quite a sort of... Oh, you just lighted on that. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking it and Stanley yeah, thought it yeah, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shall I read it? Yes, do. Yeah. Okay. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action until action. Lust is perjured, murderous, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner but despised straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated as a swallowed bait, on purpose laid to make the taker mad, mad in pursuit and in possession, so had, having and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof, and proved a very woe, before a joy proposed, behind a dream. All this the world knows well, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. It's it, it's searing, isn't it? Self-confessional, self-examination, not romantic at all. Mm. What, what do you think, um, what do you think it is about the form it, it itself of the sonnet um, that, that leads to that sort of self-confession? Because we see we see Shakespeare articulating his his personal thoughts and, and his feelings for um, a, a significant amount of time, almost 30 years um, through this form. Do you want to talk a bit about about the form itself and how, how you think that that's um, particularly suited to that purpose? Yes, I, I think when we think of the sonnet in the period, we I, I'm sure we automatically think of Shakespeare because of all the sonnet writers he absolutely seems to have taken full possession of it and made it made the form his own and outstripped the abilities of his other contemporary writers of sonnets. And, and I think the form itself um, uh, uh, is, is especially powerful because of its structure. It's compact. It's compactness. It's suitable for argument. It ends with a couplet. It, you, can, you can carry an argument through with the sonnet form. It's interesting is that the only non-dramatic poems that Shakespeare writes with the exception of the phoenix and the turtle, are in sonnet form. He clearly found it a very congenial form. He didn't write lots of lyrics and other other uh, other for, for, for other verse forms. It's a sonnet that he returns to again and again for his own personal investigation. Well, obviously, excluding Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. Well, the wrong narrative poems. Yes, but but yeah. we noted we noted when we were um, thinking about Venus and Adonis that uh, every verse in Venus and Adonis is a sestet. It's actually, as it were, part of a sonnet form, <laughs> uh, which, is, which, is, which is interesting to know. Um, I think I'm, I'm also thinking of Abraham Slender in The Merry Wives of Windsor, who says, I'd rather than 40 shillings have my book, of, have, have my book of songs and sonnets here. And he's referring to a, a famous book of the period no, known as Tottle's Miscellany. And I mention that because there's a sense in which Sonnets would turn to by readers as maybe like self-help manuals that, you know, they'll give you ideas, they'll give you guidance about how to be in love, how to feel, how, love, to, woo. Emotion, how to woo and page in Abraham Slender's case, for example. Um, so, and I think we see Shakespeare using the form differently throughout the collection, whether it's three quatrains followed by a couplet as is the usual structure, or whether it's a sonnet like Sonnet 30 or Sonnet 129 that Stanley just read, that you get the first 12 lines and then the turning point on the couplet. There's always a turning point. Usually it comes at, at line nine, but it doesn't have to. It can come as, it can come as late as line 13. Um, and as you outlined, the um, the addition is is particularly distinguished by the fact that it orders the sonnets in in the probable order of composition. Um, what what do you think that the chronological approach brings to our understanding of Shakespeare as a writer? And what kind of artistic development do we see across that time span? Well, first of all, we, we're going to talk about. Um... Macdonald P. Jackson. Yeah, we ought to yeah. say that the, the 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 ordering that we uh, in the, the ordering in which we arrange the sonnets, on the whole, is not of our own, not based on our own research. It's based on the research 
of a, a New Zealand scholar, a very well-known important scholar called MacDonald P. Jackson, who over the last 30 years or so has done a lot of work on, on, the, sonnet, on the ordering, on the dating of the sonnets, based mainly on re relationships of vocabulary and a sentence structure with the plays, which are more easily d datable, some of them. Uh, we have departed from that, though, in one or two cases. Most significantly, uh, we've put uh, at the beginning of the volume the two sonnets which are published last in the 1609 volume. Those are the two which are both translations from a Latin epigram uh, of the 5th century AD uh, about Cupid, a little story about Cupid. Uh, and we uh, place them first uh, because one of them is, is a revision of the other. This was shown by a, a, another scholar at one, at one point. And we, we speculate that, that Shakespeare may have had to do this at school as a school exercise. Uh, Latin and Greek were both taught, of course, in the Stratford upon Avon Grammar School, and we found it easier to imagine Shakespeare writing this sort of academic exercise when he was still a schoolboy, perhaps a sixth form, you know, not 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 a, not an eight or nine year old, uh, uh, than at any other point in his life. So we we took that slightly bold step of beginning the volume uh, with, the, with the two last printed. I, I think also we demonstrate that the, how important the form was to Shakespeare. He's writing these poems over 30 years. So not only does that mean they're not a sequence, it means that he can't let the form alone, that he's you know constantly to, yeah, referring yeah, back to it. So for example, in sonnet form. He thinks it's easy for him to think in sonnet form. And yet um, in terms of artistic development, well, every sonnet, even as it were the early ones, com, um, are, are, are expressions of great, artistic sophistication on Shakespeare's part. And it, so it's not, it's not straightforward to be able to say something like, oh, the early ones are easier to understand. That's not necessarily the case. Look at a, a sonnet like 136, for example. It takes uh, at least two, two or three readings before you really start to grasp the meaning. Um, but one wants to say that there's a big difference, for example, between sonnet 145, which is printed late in the 1609 collection out of 154, um, it begins, those lips that love's own hand did make, breathed forth the sound that said, I hate. Iambic tetrameter, not pentameter, uh, when set against a sonnet as difficult and as subtle as, for example, sonnet 121, which is printed, um, which begins, uh, Tis better to be vile than vile esteemed when not to be received, reproach of being, and the just pleasure lost, which is so deemed not by our feeling, but by others seeing. You're immediately in, a, in, a, in, a, in an extremely dense place intellectually and poetically with the beginning of 121 compared to um, uh, 145. Now, those are, those are, I've deliberately chosen them at extreme ends of the chronology. So although 145 was printed late, in the 1609 collection, Andrew Gurr showed us in 1971 that it might be Shakespeare's first poem or an early poem, perhaps as early as, um, 108, uh, as, as 1582, written as a, a courting poem or a marriage poem to, to Anne Hathaway. When he was 18. When he was just 18. Because it puns on the name Anne Hathaway. It, 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 its final couplet reads, I hate from hate away she threw and save my life saying not you. So mm. Hathaway and Hathaway were alternative pronunciations. But Sonnet 121 that I quoted at the beginning of a second ago is, is probably 1600 to 1604. So it's, it's, it's as, almost as late as you can get as far as the 1609 uh, quarto is concerned. Uh, but then you, you move beyond that and you look at Helen's um, extremely difficult sonnet in Act 1, Scene 2 of All's Well That Ends Well, uh, which begins, our remedies often themselves do lie. Uh, again, uh, one really has to riddle the meaning of that one, Master Shakespeare. Not easy, I'd say, for the person playing Helen to to put that over um, in performance in an immediately understandable way. Mm -hmm. And and um, I guess you slightly touched on this already, but um, uh, Wordsworth uh, famously wrote that Shakespeare unlocked his heart through the sonnets. Um, what, what do you think that we learn about Shakespeare the man through them? I think we, we, we learn a very great deal about Shakespeare's through the sonnets. 
partly about his artistry, of course, but partly about his intimate life. And I think these the, these poets show Shakespeare examining deep, very deeply, his own emotions, his sexuality, uh, his, his relationship with other people, with both a man, um, at least one man and at least one woman. Two loves I have, one of the poems begins, of comfort and despair. And one of those is a man and the other is a woman, colored ill, he says. Uh, these are, and this is why we, we say they are, all of Shakespeare is, is on the psychiatrist's couch in some cases, trying to work out for himself his own most intimate emotional state, which is one of the reasons why I think personally he didn't want the, these poems uh, to be published in his lifetime at least. Two of them were published in 1598 or 9 in a little book called The Passionate Pilgrim and they were two, uh, they are two of the most intent, intense ones. Somehow one or two of them escaped the net, got out of Shakespeare's control and, and were pirated in, in, in that publication. They were known about in his, own, in his earlier years because Francis Mears, a literary chronicler who wrote a book published in 1598 called Pallidus T on which treasured treasury refers in that book to Shakespeare's sonnets among his private friends, which suggests that somehow Mears knew, may, may have known Shakespeare, probably did, uh, that Shakespeare was writing sonnets, but they weren't for public consumption. They were among his private, among his uh, uh, most intimate acquaintances and friends. So the sonnet that Stanley quoted from a moment ago, Sonnet 144, Two Loves I Have a Comfort and Despair, was one of the first printed in The Passionate Pilgrim. Um, in 1598, no, 1599, um, and from that, um, those two loves stems the um, imagined addressees of the fair youth and the dark lady, which are are still haunting readings of these poems. Oh. It's it's simply not the case, necessarily the case that because he mentions two loves in one poem, those same two loves have to be applied across the entire collection yeah, cool. written yeah. over 20 odd years or yeah. so. Uh, that surely is, 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 is not what this project um, of, of, of writing sonnets is about for Shakespeare yeah. because they're also different. So one of the things we, um, are, we, we make very clear in our book is whether, and we say at the, at the foot of the page, whether the sonnet is definitely addressed to a male subject or a female or whether it could be addressed to either and most of the sonnets, of course, could be addressed to either a male or a female. We set them out um, on a on a table at one point, and um, it's 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 pretty clear that 14 out of 154 are addressed to a male, definitely. Another 13 might be if you read them sequentially, one following another, because of the the, the context, if you like, or they're in, perhaps imply a male through. Uh, not 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 through personal pronouns, but through use of different use of language, that seven are addressed to a female, and that five more, three more, three more are likely to be addressed to a female. But eighty four of them could be addressed to either a male or a female. Um, and then and then where are the others directed? That doesn't add up to one hundred and fifty four. So two are sonnet letters. Um, Six sonnets are addressed to abstract concepts, for example, to time, to the muse, to the poet's soul. Um, and 25 sonnets aren't addressed to anybody. They're meditations. Well, it was a religious meditation. They're, they're, it was only a religious poem. They're, they're little essays in miniature. So, for example, there are, one of them is about um, uh, one of them is about lust that Stanley quoted from. One of them is about eyesight on t about time, not addressed to time. Um, so, when you can read a, you can a sonnet can hit you and you think, oh gosh, this is this is. Oh, this is this must be to the fair youth. This must be to the dark lady. If you're, you know, using that kind of traditional lens, whereas if you look closely, it's not addressed to anybody. So how can we say it's addressed to a person? It's if it's about um, on the freedom of love, for example, that's sonnet 25, or or the sickness of love, sonnet 119. So these are complex poems and multifaceted, and and we really hope that our book puts over there nuances and their complexities rather than wielding a sort of blunt narrative which has been brought to the poems for so long. The, the words was that you quoted uh, with this key Shakespeare unlocked his heart was countered by, by Robert Browning 
who said, if so, the less Shakespeare he. And this is an argument which is, which is perennial about are the, how, to what extent do the sonnets reveal Shakespeare's most intimate thoughts and feelings? We uh, are on Wordsworth's side, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. We do, we do think that Shakespeare is unlocking his heart in a way that was not for public consumption in his own time, but was for, for his own, for, in order to sort out his, so in some cases, his own uh, emotional and sexual traumas. Now, if, if, if we'd um, touched on that question 15 years ago, I'd have been on Matthew Arnold's side. Oh, was it been Matthew Arnold? No. Oh, I thought it was Matthew Arnold. I thought it was Browning. Oh, sorry, Browning. 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 Yeah. Browning. Sorry, what, Matthew? What did Matthew Arnold say? <laughs> well, oh <my>. Anyway, um, <laughs> Robert Browning. Um, I'd, I'd have been, I'd have been on, um, on his side, thinking of them more as literary exercises. Mm. But what changed on, that for you, Paul? Working on them as closely as, as, as I have on uh, for this book, mm. and, and certainly the, the, the uncoupling of the traditional order of the 1609 and putting the sonnets and the plays among them just revealed their personality to me in a, in a way that I thought, oh my goodness, this is hugely exciting. I really feel with these poems, we can catch glimpses of Shakespeare as, as, uh, that we just haven't realized before. So for example, sonnets 50 and 51 are definitely written from the point of view of somebody riding a horse, which Shakespeare did often when commuting between Stratford and Avon and London, a journey of about three to four days, for example. Um, and there's something, isn't there, about the trotting of the horse or the uh, movement of the horse, which is you know, iambic, literally, with the horse's movement. Um, and, and we know, don't we? We know that poets think about their work when they're out and about doing the gardening or traveling. And I'm sure Shakespeare did a lot of thinking about his plays and his poems on horseback between Stratford, Wenaven and London. Um, but, you know, one of the poems, for example, 136, ends with, my name is Will. Well, the, the minute you admit that as a pun, as a shortened version of William Shakespeare, obviously it is, my name is Will. Well, this surely this, this lets in Shakespeare's DNA straight away, doesn't it? And that whole poem you, uh, plays on the word, on the various meanings of the word yeah. will, which could be sexual, of course, could be uh, literally, physically sexual, the will or willy, as we call it. And, and by our reckoning, there are six poems in the collection which also pun on the, on the word will, which, which could be, you know, in association with his own first name. Yeah. So they, 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 they require very delicate um, handling and thought. They, they are difficult poems and partly for the, it's partly for this reason that ev in every case when we, pr we, pr we print notes to the sonnets and to the passage from the plays explaining difficult difficulties, vocabulary difficulties and others, and also at the back of the book we publish a, a full paraphrase of every sonnet and every sonnet-like extract from the play, uh, it, 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 prose paraphrases, intended to be useful rather than uh, literary, as it were. We, we worked hard on those, didn't we? Yeah, so I mean, this, this reminds me of the day when Stanley turned to me when we were producing the book and said, Paul, these are such difficult poems. And I said, Stanley, if you and I think that, what, what about our readers? And, and so from that day on, we thought we must do something to make these poems as intelligible as possible. And I remember talking to you, Emily, about it at the Shakespeare Association of America conference and saying, I'm gonna put in a little um, uh, uh, um, thumbnails, thumbnail description of each sonnet at the foot of the page. And then we thought, well, we need to do paraphrases as well. So thank you to Cambridge University Press for allowing us to, for this to be a slightly longer book than was originally intended by including the paraphrases. and. Um, they're at the back of the book. And reading them, you ask about Shakespeare's personality. If you want to know in modern prose how Shakespeare thought, read about three or four of our paraphrases, um, one after another, and it will just get you into his mind because they're literal paraphrases. We tried to replicate something of the slight awkwardness of thought, the contortions of thought within the sonnets themselves, rather than producing a kind of smooth translation. That's, that wasn't our project. We wanted the paraphrases to kick a little bit in terms of um, the difficulty rendered in modern prose. We hope that that uh, makes the book particularly suitable for educational purposes, uh, for, for use uh, in schools, as well as by, by the ordinary reader who wants to, to understand the plays properly, because it, it is unique to our volume. I don't know 
uh, of any other printed collections or if you are online w which offer this sort of prose paraphrase so uh, we yeah, hope that's uh, yeah. useful i mean every edition of shakespeare well if it's worth its salt climbs on the backs of giants so you look at what's already been done you think what can i use what's going to be helpful to me and you know every sonnet edition we went to uh, comparing glosses and explications at the foot of the page none of them actually tell you what the lines really mean I mean they'll give you they'll, they'll gloss words and they'll say that this word is used in Hamlet or whatever it might be and or in this this other text of the period but when when a reader is really stuck and, and trying to riddle out the meaning you're floating at sea with 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 the edition in front of you and that's why we thought we're not gonna let that happen with our edition we're going to give an explanation a paraphrase of each sonnet to let the reader in as much as possible. So we hope this volume has a very wide potential readership. It, it, it is of scholarly interest because some of the things that we do it have never been done before. It's also of educational value because of the the way with that we help we try to help people to understand the sonnets both through notes and through paraphrases. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure they're, they're going to be really useful in the classroom, as you say, as well as, uh, as for personal reading um, purposes. Um, I wonder if for our kind of final final question in, in the interview section, um, whether you could just talk a little bit more about um, the distinguishing feature of the edition as, as including sonnets from the plays and, and really what you think this does in terms of opening up new connections for us between the traditional sequence and, and the drama. Well, for ex one, of the, one of the things we um, also uh, draw attention to in the book and in order to, well, first of all, these are mentioned in the, in the, in the notes of the foot of the page, but let me show you um, sonnet, 57, for example. Um, this is a sonnet that begins, being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and minute, hours and times of your desire? Um, and if you read the, the note, it compares it to, this could be Kate in The Taming of the Shrew speaking to Petruccio. And, and we draw attention to what we call dramatic analogies. And a quick reference to those are, in the numerical index at the back, they have a little asterisk next to them. So you can go to the sonnet and find a dramatic analogy. That one could be Kate in The Taming of the Shrew. Here it goes. Being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend, nor services to do till you require. Nor dare I chide the world without end hour, whilst I, my sovereign, watch the clock for you nor think the bitterness of absence sour when you have bid your servant once adieu. Nor dare I question with my jealous thought where you may be or your affairs suppose, but like a sad slave, stay and think of naught, save where you are, how happy you make those. So true a fool, of, is, a fool is love, that in your will, though you do anything, he thinks no ill. So at once it could be Kate to Petruccio speaking ironically, or speaking very sincerely that I really am your slave in love and, and I trust you and I love you. I read it ironically, of course, but it can be read the other way. Um, but then just, just as, as I pointed in, the, in line 13, so true a fool of love that in your will, you know, it may or may not be, but it could be a, a, a drawing attention to Shakespeare's first name um, as well. Though you do anything, he thinks no ill. So they're multivalent. 32 sonnets are asterisked in terms of their reminders. They don't have to be, but they're just reminders of characters in Shakespeare's plays. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Paul and Stanley. Um, I'm, I'm now going to hand over to you both um, and also to the audience members for the, the Q&A part of the session. Um, so do keep the questions coming in. And um, Paul and Stanley will try and answer as many as possible before the hour is up. Well, thank you. Um, they are coming in thick and fast. We'll do our, our best to uh, respond to as many as possible. Um, somebody said um, early on in the session, no fair youth and dark lady, no, no ordering uh, pattern anymore. Stanley, what would you say to a reaction uh, like that? There is, a, there, there are certainly uh, sonnets addressed to uh, a young male. The first seventeen are, uh, are addressed to or, or concerning one, but these are not pervasive uh, identifications throughout the sequence. As Malone and many people following Malone, including modern writers, 
say that you, you still get people repeating this assertion that the first 124 are addressed to uh, a young man. They're not. Some of them are. And similarly with the so-called dark lady in the last section of, of, of the volume, for example, the, the so-called dark lady sonnets include one religious meditation. They include the two uh, classical translations. Uh, they, uh, they include the one addre the clearly addressed to Anne Hathaway, who may or may not have been dark. Uh, so this is a, the, the, the collection, I refuse to call it a sequence. The collection has far more variety of addressees uh, many uh, uh, the, the, the sure and, and and also if we go looking for um, sequences we can find mini sequences yeah, yeah. in the collection and we, we draw attention to yeah. these so there are little runs of sonnets on, on on themes Stanley's mentioned the ones about procreation the first 17 for example but, but then Shakespeare's very fond of writing sequels to the sonnets this hasn't properly been drawn to our attention before on 19 occasions he writes a sequel to a sonnet. So 38 sonnets form pairs, form 19 pairs. Grammatically linked often. Grammatically linked often, or, the, or they just follow on as, as you read them. So they, the pair really stands out. Our chronological arrangement has not separated no, those pairs. Yeah. Well, it might have done, but it hasn't. And it's not separated the mini sequences, which is interesting. So th this, this um, puts, as it were, an ordering mind at work within the collection, but it's not as as it as a whole a sequence by any stretch of the imagination. No. Someone asks, would you recommend that we should stop teaching Shakespeare the poet in one term and Shakespeare the playwright in another, um, because of that uh, it might be an artificial separation? Certainly, uh, it is an artificial separation. After all, the poems, the plays, uh, contain a very great deal uh, of poetry, uh, 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 and the the, the sonnets. Uh, in, include lyrical lyrical poems and poems of dramatic uh, dramatic relevance. I think so. Uh, I mean, yes, I think so. Yeah. What do you think, Paul? Well, I think I'm all for shaking them up a bit, and I want to pay tribute to the editor of the Oxford Shakespeare, um, the publisher that shall not be named, um, on my left, um, uh, and how groundbreaking it was, Stanley, that you put. The sonnets in the chronology of the plays. Yeah, so normally in complete works yeah. until the Oxford Shakespeare broke onto the scene. In 1986. They, they were, in 1986. The sonnets and the narrative poems were hived off at the back. You've got yeah. the plays first and you've got the, and you've got the poems. Um, and the Oxford Shakespeare editors put them in among all the um, play. Yeah, uh, but even so, we still kept the, we kept them as, as, as the Sure, uh, but, but, but that, 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 did, that did quite it, a lot to make did, us think about did, Shakespeare as a a single-bodied yes, artist right. a, rather a body than... body of work. Yeah. Rather, yeah. What I would want to say, though, Stanley, is our collection, our edition does show how the voice of Shakespeare writing a sonnet is very different in a 1609 collection to the voice writing the sonnets in the plays. Yes, the sonnets in the plays are, are, are more varied. Some of them are, are comic, of course, uh, heroic. Some of them are interior meditations like the 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 sonnet like uh, speech of Cressida in Troyes and Cressida for example some of them are parodic as in the Love's Labours as as we've mentioned some of them are declamatory like the prologues the two prologues to to Romeo and Juliet Romeo and Juliet of course includes a, a, a sonnet piece of romantic dialogue the first meeting of Romeo and Juliet when they declare their love for one another uh, falls in, into sonnet four and I'm sure Shakespeare is inviting his audience there to draw on the associations that the sonnet sequences of the 1590s would have had in that play written we believe about 1595 towards the end of the, the great popularity of the sonnet sequences. Um, Caroline Henley, hello Caroline it's it's nice that you're you're, you're here um, I last saw you in Stratford-upon-Avon um, asks, are there any sonnets which you still think, after having made your final decisions, are problematic in terms of their placement in the chronology? How about we talk about those final two, which we paid yeah, for the final study? Yeah. That, that is a bit controversial. We, it is controversial. We, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what sonnets 153 and 154 we put first? Yeah, yeah yes. You talked uh, about earlier, but yeah, it's controversial. Uh, one of the things we're trying to 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 uh, counter though is the idea that those shows Shakespeare suffering from, from venereal disease and oh. going to Bath to find a cure. As has often been said of those. And, and you'll see that in some of the major editions that are, that are current. 
they're not about sh about Shakespeare having a venereal disease. They're about uh, about Cupid. Uh, uh, based on ep an epigram by Mariana Scholastica. Uh, the fifth century. Yeah, the fifth century. So uh, there's a great variety there. I mean, the, the a really good way, a, a foundational reason for putting them at the front um, was that Shakespeare seems mainly to have been translating classical texts as a schoolboy when he was at school. We don't yeah. see him doing it during his career. Full of classical illusions, that's not the same as taking a text and translating it. No, but it's also true that the earlier plays contain far more uh, passages in, in Latin, for example, than the later plays. Titus, early Titus, early Titus, in his career, Titus. Shakespeare in Titus and Andronicus, for example, Shakespeare is, is, is using Latin because it's, it's close to his education. Later, the Latin is submerged. It goes beneath the surface in, in, in the rhetoric of the other plays. And he's not so self-consciously using quotations from classical literature. He's using classical literature as later to Tempest, of course. Question, um, at a time when we can't easily access live Shakespeare performance, do you think that the sonnets may have particular value or appeal at a time when we can't actually go to the theatre ourselves? Yes, I think they are. I think, I think so. What do you think? Well, I think they do, and I know they have for me. I mean, I've been I've been recording them yeah. on on uh, social media. I, every every day since the 25th of March, I've put a little bit of audio recorded Shakespeare uh, out there onto my SoundCloud account, often and on, including sonnets, often including sonnets, but not only sonnets, not only, no. but other people have been doing that. Mm. You know, Pat, uh, Patrick Stewart um, famously have been, has been reading sonnets during lockdown. Um, uh, someone I, I know on Twitter, Arthur Wood, um, a poet, has read all the sonnets in reverse order from 154 back to number one. Um, I think it's because they are they are miniaturized. We feel that we have a, a whole experience in front of us. It takes a minute to read. It takes far longer to digest. So they are themselves, as it were, fortifying for the mind and for the emotions, I'd say. Um, could you explore a little more some moments when sonnets um, occur in the plays? Is there a common reason why a character needs a sonnet or is each occurrence individual to a character's trajectory? I would say the latter, wouldn't you? The, the, the sonnets within the plays uh, uh, they're there because Shakespeare felt that at a particular point in the story, sonnet form gave him the the the, the means, the, the channel through which to 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 uh, to express the character's emotions, like as in Cressida, for example, or more in a, in a lighter way, the the, sh the foreshortened sonnet that Beatrice speaks as she comes out of hiding. Uh, what fire is mine ears? In mine ears, it begins. And you just maybe had the thought for the first time, Stanley, that therefore the sonnet form for Shakespeare is like a magnifying glass on someone's emotions. Yeah. It's as if, yeah. you know, step into the limelight. Yeah, Let's have the spotlight yeah. on you, Beatrice, or on Cressida, yeah. or on Helen, or on Barone, <clears throat> or on Antipolis of Syracuse. The, the action s stops for a moment mm. while he. Uh, expands into it's a magnifying glass for the yeah, emotions. Yeah, which, yeah. You know, if that's if that's a helpful image, then turn that back onto Shakespeare himself, and the, the, all the things we were we were describing um, earlier on about um, Shakespeare's own personality in these in these poems. That's why it's such an important form for him. It's a magnifying glass for his own emotions and thinking, and and they always happen. In moments, to Shakespeare, so. they, they always happen in the plays that happen, don't they? At moments of revelation. Um, I suppose that's stepping into the limelight, isn't it? Seeing more than you thought you would of a character, uh, or epiphany. So, for example, um, or deity, Diana in Pericles, Jupiter in Cymbeline speaks on it. They're they're in the collection in our book. How did you develop your paraphrases of the sonnets? Did you rely on any particular sources? No, we started from scratch, didn't yes, we? Yes, we did. We each did them and then handed them to one back to the other, who, who then ages. improved them. It took ages. <laughs> Polished them. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was it was a very it was very good for the soul. Of course, while we were doing them, we looked up the notes, uh, our own notes, the notes of other editors too, uh, if we if we felt a, a difficulty in, in discerning the the meaning. Do you want to read an example of a paraphrase? Well, look quickly, because we... Quickly. Oh, it. OK, <laughs> maybe not. We'll let you discover them for yourselves. Um, Skip Nicholson. Hi, Skip. Hello, Skip. Can, you tell, can you tell how you assigned some to pairs or groups? Well, OK, so um, the simplest thing to say is they had they all of them assigned to pairs and groups appeared sequentially 
in the 1609 collection and the chronology had not separated them. So for example, um, one pair is 149 and 150, which is about the power of the loved one. Um, another pair um, is about a triangular relationship. There are, there are three triangular relationships in the sonnets, 133, 134, and 40 to 42, and then 144. And it's not necessarily the same triangular relationship either. And these grammatical links like but, a sonnet beginning but. Or so, or, or then, or, yeah. or then um, they also Following on from the previous pairings, one, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a school of thought that Shakespeare was a recusant, or at least nostalgic for the old faith. Have you seen any evidence of faith in the sonnets? Well, there is evidence of faith, yes, certainly in 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 one four five above all poor soul. She said one four five. The center, one four six. One four yeah. six. The center of my sinful earth. Rebuke these rebel powers that the array. That is Shakespeare's most explicitly religious poem. Addressed to his, his addressed to his own soul. Addressed to his own soul. But I don't see any. And it, I don't see any clues as to his own particular religious no, affiliation. And, and, and nor do I. And, and I've, I've, I've made us, I've, I've been especially um, alert to that. Paul is himself a priest. I speak as a, as a priest in the, Angli in the Church of England, so I'm especially alert to uh, religious language. Um, I have, however, and this is, this is, this is, this is a different um, uh, way into the, answering the question. I have, for example, used sonnets as spiritual reflection working with fellow Christians. So, for example, you know, read Sonnet 29, when in disgrace with fortune of men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble death heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, happily I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. You can read thee in that poem as God, or, it's the, or, or the, the loving heavenly father. If you read that through a religious lens, it takes you to heaven. It takes you to the kingdom of God rather than the earthly kingdom at the end of that sonnet. So that's just one example of how they can be you know, used in different contexts. Um, what about the so-called rival poet? Are any sonnets addressed to him? There are sonnets addressed uh, uh, which are about rival poets yeah. and about rivalry in poetry. Um, and they are the ones that you would expect from the traditional um, readings um, in the 80s, aren't they? about rival about rival yeah, poets yeah. um we don't identify no we don't it's not, we, that's don't, not the project. we don't make any attempt to identify individuals one of the sorts is a letter uh and I, I, I I'm inclined to suspect it's addressed to the Earl of Southampton, but that's conjecture rather than fact. Well, do you want to say more about that, Stanley? Because that is Sonnet 26. Yeah, this is the, the, the this is the one accompanying the, the almanac, is it? Uh, no, there are no, two. No, this no, this two, is the one that, yeah. that has been Capel Edward Capel suggested that this, this might have accompanied the Rape of Lucrece or Luc the poem Lucrece to the Earl of Southampton. It begins, Lord of my love, to whom in vassalage thy merit hath my duty strongly knit. To thee I send this written embassage to witness duty, not to show my wit. So the written embassage is the poem I've just been reading, is a kind of letter sonnet. Um, and that's one of the letters in the collection. The other one is 77, which um, accompanied the gift of an almanac. So two of these sonnets are Shakespeare's personal correspondence. Yeah, but you see that almanac identification was only made a couple of years ago. Uh, it's interesting how thought about the sonnets has, has been ongoing. Uh, and at the same time, thought about the sonnets has often been retarded. People have, have failed to read them uh, in their own right because of the preconceptions that were set off, especially by Malone in the so 18th century. Just as our book was going to press, Adam Barker at the Shakespeare Institute properly identified and uh, that the notebook that many critics spotted um, in, in relation to Sonnet 77 was actually an almanac. The, the almanacs had blank pages in them, so you could re make, make your own notes about the knowledge you were acquiring as you read the almanac. 
Um, so we were able to cite um, a student at the Shakespeare Institute, University of Birmingham, um, in our book, weren't we? Yeah. We're very grateful for him for pointing this out to us. So that sonnet is one of the more public sonnets in the volume, that, uh, at least one of, the, one of the less introspective ones. It's, it's a utilitarian sonnet also. Shakespeare writing a, 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 sort of a sort of thank you letter, uh, that, that sort of thing. Let's take some more questions. Yeah. When I was studying Shakespeare, my teachers always said not to read modern prose translations of the plays, but rather to muddle through the plays until I grasped the meaning of my own. Would you say the casual reader would be discouraged to understand the poems on his own and be tempted to read some prose summaries you have included of the sonnets before trying to read the poems on their own? Do you know what? You can do whatever you like. Follow your heart. Follow your mind. Do what is best for you. At the foot of our page, you'll get the quickest way into the poem with a little tiny thumbnail sketch. So, for example, um, Sonnet 90, um, the little thumbnail sketch reads, if you're going to leave me, do it quickly. And then you can see that and think, well, do I want to read Sonnet 90 or am I, am I in a different mood? And then you might flick through and read, to bequeath your good looks to your own child would keep you alive and in being an act of good husbandry for yourself. I want a more romantic one than that. And so you can flick through and look at the foot, little thumbnail sketches and decide whether you're going to read the sonnet above it or you can just read through the sonnets as printed and ignore our notes. And we've deliberately put all the paraphrases in a section at the back so you can ignore them entirely if you want to. Gregory so, Doran found these little thumbnail sketches particularly about Yeah, them, especially for actors wanting yeah. to try out exercises. You can immediately see, you know, what you're letting yourself in, what you're letting yourself in for before you read the poem above the, the thumbnail sketch. Um, it's our hope that uh, schools and universities will, um, you know, invite students to write their own paraphrases against ours and, you know, kick against them a bit and, and, and come up with better we don't, paraphrases. We don't come, yeah, the paraphrase is inevitably reductive. Um, I used a Shakespeare sonnet in a shared reading group uh, in a care home pre-COVID. The complexity of some of the texts I chose didn't always go down well, I bet. But when people had studied a text in their youth, they felt more comfortable talking about them. It is interesting, however, to see a text fresh without the baggage of previous study. Do the notes in the book open up a lot of questions or are they informed opinions? <laughs> Stanley. I would say on the whole they're, they're informed opinions, wouldn't you? The notes in the book? Yes, I think so. We're not, you know. No, we, we, we allow for ambiguity. We allow for alternative interpretation. Of course, yes. Um, talking, taking the Wordsworth perspective, how do you consider the impact of the fair youth and the dark lady in Shakespeare's artistic development? Well, we, we would say there's no, no youth and no dark lady. We, we need to forget them entirely. You need to do to them what Virginia Woolf did to the angel of ha in the house. She flung the bottle of ink at it. That's, that's our best recommendation to you. Well, I wouldn't go quite so far <laughs> as that because I do think the first 17 are, are addressed to a young man uh, with whom the poet feels great affection, perhaps even in love, but at the same time is, ad is advising that young man to marry. So I go along to some degree with those first 17 poems with the interpretation of their being written possibly to commission, or at least as a request uh, in a, a, an intimate personal situation. Again, I'm a bit inclined to think of the Earl of Southampton. Emily has appeared back on the screen. And... Uh, <laughs> you've got time for one, one last question, if you've got a quick one. Um, is there a specific sonnet pair of sonnets that you feel is particularly revealing of Shakespeare's personality above all the others? That's from Jen, our friend Jen Richardson. Um, revealing of his personality. Well, that's a difficult one to finish with. Um, let me have a quick look at our ordering of the pairs. Sonnet 71 and 72, about the poet possibly possibly being forgotten after his decease. There's a lot about death. He's, he's very, very much concerned. No longer mourns me when I am dead. And yeah. it has a sequel, Sonnet 72. This, this again is one of the very intimate personal things about these poems. Quite a lot of them see are rather gloomy in their attitude uh, to life and death and, and, and are sad at the thought that he's going to leave behind uh, somebody who loves him. So thank you, Jen, for um, prompting us to have those two sonnets, that pair, 
uh, jump out at us just now to finish off with. Thank you.